Grammy award-winning violinist James Ennis has established himself as one of the most sought-after soloists on the international stage. His reputation is built on a warm, lyrical tone, pristine technique, and a commitment to make every performance his best. Every day, there's somebody there where it's an opportunity for them to have a special experience, and they have chosen to spend their time and money to have a good experience. And if you're not in a position to be fairly certain that you can deliver that, then that's, that's tough. You're listening to Speaking Soundly, a backstage pass to today's biggest stars of the music world. I'm your host, David Krause, principal trumpet of the Metropolitan Opera. During each episode, you'll hear me speak with inspiring performers about their creative process and the personal journey that led them to the stage. We haven't met in person, but we have crossed paths. In fact, in 2018, you performed the Mozart Violin Concerto with my orchestra at Carnegie Hall. And while you were playing the concerto, your suspender came undone with all the moving around and the audience noticed and the orchestra noticed, even the New York Times noticed, they actually put that in your review. You know, I had completely forgotten about that. I remember now, I think it was actually the vest. And I think that that strap had come undone or, or something. It's one of those things, right? Live performance. I mean, at least my pants didn't fall off. Could have been worse. <laughs> well, there's that. But it was pretty remarkable to see you in that moment because... I watched you go from a person who was dealing with a very practical matter of, of this little wardrobe malfunction, making a joke to the audience, and then all of a sudden you launch into two solo Bach encores that were just mesmerizing. Yeah, these are two very different skills that were right on top of each other. How do you go so quickly between the two? Is there a, a switch that gets flipped in your head? You know, that's some... Um... It's a really interesting question. I, I, I've thought about how the mind is somewhat um, bifurcated, you know, when we're performing. You ever have people talk to you and they say, oh, you're, you're playing such beautiful music. You know, you must just completely lose yourself in the beauty of what you're doing. And it's like, well, no, that would, <laughs> that would not be a good idea. You know, there's a part of oneself that is, I think, kind of hyper aware of, you know, where you are and your surroundings and what exactly needs to be done to accomplish the task at hand. But then there's that other part that needs to be very, very creative and, and yeah, maybe somewhat lost in the single-minded focus of that piece of music. It seems very foreign to people that don't do it. I'm at my best when I feel like I'm kind of relating to an audience. Like I always enjoy the opportunity to you know, to speak to an audience a little bit or just somehow feel like that wall is a bit broken down as as the performer. If you can manage to be friendly and, and engaging when the time is right and also, you know, really musically committed and focused when uh, when you're doing your job, then, you know, you're hopefully giving them the best experience you can. And what's that experience like for you from the perspective of the performer? Like, what are you getting out of that connection that you're making with the audience? Is there a palpable feeling that you can describe? You know, it's hard to say. I think that I am not by nature one of these people that that tends to to indulge in, you know, spiritual discussions of, you know, mystical connections and, and this, that. I, I'm fairly um, analytical and straightforward on a lot of subjects. Uh, but that being said, I do feel that there is some some sort of exchange of energy with an audience. Like, and, and I think I felt the lack of it a lot during the pandemic shutdowns. You know, playing for a camera is not like playing for an audience that you can see and that, you know, it, it's funny because in a way, the the best feedback you can get from an audience is silence, right? Which is by its nature, the lack of feedback. But I think that one can feel when a concert hall is really focused and at attention, that's a special sensation that I think performers feel. I think audience members feel it, you know, when when everyone is sort of holding their breath for that magical moment. I feel like I definitely feed off of audiences. And I do think that there is a relationship there. It's just hard to define exactly how that 
works. I think in the group of world-class soloists that you're in, you stand out as very unique in that. You say that your job is no different than anyone else doing a job with great skill and care. Do you think of yourself more as a, a craftsman or as an artist? And where do you think this sense of artistic humility comes from? I mean, it's very difficult to define. I, I remember my dad used to say to me, if I was feeling nervous as a little kid, he'd say, you know, you're not walking a tightrope without a net. You're not performing brain surgery. It's like the stakes aren't that high. <laughs> but the other side of that and the side that, that maybe I don't talk about as much, except for to the people that I'm really close to, is that the stakes maybe are not that high, but the possibilities are limitless. And the impact that great art can make on someone's life is immeasurable, irreplaceable, and incomparable. I think sometimes because it's difficult to talk about the art itself, people end up talking about the artist. And I think that, you know, sometimes that's a bit of a funny thing was because, yeah, I feel like we're extremely lucky people to work intimately with the greatest uh, creative minds, many of which are, are no longer alive, but we're still interacting with them. We're, we're learning from them. We're, we're put in this incredible uh, fortunate position to be able to share ideas, whether it's learned or instinctual or both. We have a special insight into this and to be able to share this language of emotion. It's an incredible privilege. But then again, it's like everybody who works hard and, and does something well, that's also fantastic. I guess what I would say is that I deserve credit for working hard. I don't know that I deserve credit for being the lucky one that gets to be close to Beethoven. Been very lucky to have that opportunity. And I work very hard to maximize the, the gifts I have and to maximize the opportunities that I have. So I guess what I would say is I look at myself as, yes, as an artist, but as a, as a craftsman as well, because if I'm not a craftsman, I can't actually pass along the art. When you were younger, I'm sure you had benchmark players and recordings that had a real impact on you as a developing musician. How do you feel now knowing that your recordings are providing that same inspiration to a new generation of violinists? It was uh, 12, 15 years ago or something that I remember still feeling like I was young. <laughs> you know, maybe I was in my early 30s or something. So when I would go to an orchestra, it was like, oh, I'm young. I'm going to, I feel a kinship with the young members of the orchestra. I'm, I was hanging out with a couple of young violinists in the orchestra and, you know, it's like, oh, where'd you go to school? And you know, it turns out you went to the same school and it's like, oh, when were you there? And they get this look in their eyes. They're like, dude, not, not. Yeah. You like, never ask. You never <laughs> yeah. Ask that. Yeah. yeah. It's like, uh, sorry, grandpa. No. Um, but it was, it was talking to these musicians and, and it was the nicest thing that the person could say. But still, it kind of hit me hard when they were like, you know, your, your recording of, it was, it was, it was the first recording I made. It was a, the Paganini Caprice. He's like, that was, you know, the first recording I owned that, you know, my parents gave it to me when they gave me a violin. And I was like, oh, that's really weird. It makes me feel really old. But, <laughs> um, you know, I, I love the idea of it. I find it very moving and it's very touching to me. It's very meaningful to me because I really, I grew up with recordings. You know, I, I grew up in a wonderful small city in Canada called Brandon, Brandon, Manitoba. It's kind of off the beaten path and, you know, it wasn't the sort of place where all the great violinists just came to Brandon every year. You know, it's not like New York or London. So I knew players from recordings and I'd love to think that the recordings that I make might reach people that my performances couldn't. Every once in a while, I'll get some kind of unsolicited feedback from someone and they'll write about how much they enjoyed this or that, or maybe that their introduction to a piece of music that has meant so much to them was through maybe my recording. And that, that really does mean a lot to me and is one of the one of the things that has fueled me uh, in 
making so many recordings over the years because it's it's become like a like a mania for me it's like i've made so many recordings it's kind of ridiculous like i mean my my own family hasn't even heard all of them at this point yeah i'm not sure i've heard all of them either but i've certainly heard enough to hear one particular aspect that i can really appreciate as an instrumentalist myself which is your technical proficiency. I mean, the level of precision and control that you demonstrate every time you play is amazing. Do you consider your technical ability a vital tool in your artistic tool belt? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, that's a good way of putting it. I think technique for me is about the ability of control, which is not to say that one wants to play in a controlled way, but only if you really have the control over your instrument, do you have the control over what you're going to do? You think of, of someone like Yasha Heifetz, his technical ability allowed him to play with incredible abandon. It's not our job to do something really beautifully once in a practice room, just for ourselves. It, it's like once you know how to do that, you have to have the control to be able to reproduce that and to reproduce that every time, which is not to say that, and this, you know, I'm not going to fall into the trap of people saying, well, you know, you don't want your performance to every performance be identical. No, that's not what I'm saying. But it's that, you know, there are, we all, we all know lots of instrumentalists like this, where, where it's kind of a tragic thing where it's like, hey, on the right day, that person sounds amazing, but they haven't actually figured out the instrumental control to be able to be at their best all the time. And obviously no one's at their best all the time, but you need to have a, a range of variants that is so small that no one really knows except for you. I need my worst day to still be okay. And I think that that's a big part of technique that sometimes gets overlooked. You know, it's not about being able to do something fantastic once because as a performer, it's not fair to an audience to not always be at your best. Every day, there's somebody there where it's an opportunity for them to have a special experience and they have chosen to spend their time and their money to have a good experience. And if you're not in a position to be fairly certain that you can deliver that, then that's, that's tough. Yeah. And what about the process of developing that technique? It, it must have been so daunting, especially on the violin. There's just so much work ahead of you. Well, I, I, I think one of the advantages to starting an instrument young is that you don't have adult standards. <laughs> I think that's a particular advantage when starting the violin young. You know, people always talk about, oh, you've got to start young on the violin, the way the brain develops this or that. I think one of the biggest barriers to starting the violin at an older age is just that you sound really, really bad on the violin for a long time. <laughs> You're going to sound terrible for at least a couple of years. That's really hard to get over. When you're five, it's like, what do you know if you sound terrible? You think you sound fine. And it was probably around the age of, you know, eight or nine that, that I, I felt the ability to be able to develop somewhat of a personal sound, you know, because it was, it was really the sound of the instrument that always appealed to me. And I think as a violinist, you know, when you start to learn how to play with, with vibrato, you know, that that begins to work that muscle a little bit of, of how, how you're developing a sound that, um, that be, it becomes your voice. And when you were forming that voice, who did you model your sound after? I mean, if you had a poster of Wayne Gretzky on your wall. Well, of course I did. Yeah, I'm Canadian. Come on. Yeah, no, I don't. That was a rhetorical question. But who would have <laughs> yeah. been the, the violin equivalent of Wayne Gretzky for you? Who, who did you really try to sound like? That's um, it's a good question. I I grew up with a lot of the the recordings from the you know, 70s and early 80s of Itzhak Perlman. Like I remember just obsessing over Perlman's recording of Brahms Concerto, and I, I mean I just it, I had it on a record, and the first movement in particular I obsessed over it so much it took me months to even flip over the record because I would just listen to the the first movement and then just start it over again. 
and that was a sound that that really appealed to me. Uh, my teacher was one of the the biggest fans of Yasha Heifetz that one could imagine. So through him, I kind of discovered Heifetz and that was a sound that spoke to me. I enjoyed trying to imitate the sounds of other players from that sort of golden age of recording. But I think even at a young age, I recognized that if I could put that into my toolkit, <laughs> that that would allow me a much greater flexibility artistically to explore what I wanted to say. If you're a painter and you have all the paint, then when you paint something that is only blue, it's because you want it to be only blue. It's not because blue is the only paint you have. <laughs> you know, like, I, so I think that that's, um, I think that's important in, in developing a, as a player, you know, do try to imitate other people. How is it that they can sound like that? because if you're able to do it, then it becomes a choice. And, and it's all about choices, right? About, about that, that palette, what we can achieve. So you and I have a few things in common. Most notably for me is that your father played the trumpet like I do, and he raised a son who plays a string instrument, and I did as well. My son just graduated from Juilliard. He's a, he's a cellist. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. You know, I'm interested in his perspective of what it is to have a father who plays the trumpet because I'm always learning so much from his performances. Like if he's playing a Beethoven string quartet, I'll be like, oh my God, that's an amazing piece because I had never heard it before. And he'll say, seriously, dad, it's a very famous string quartet. <laughs> and so I, I'm convinced that he just thinks that I'm uh, a dumb trumpet player. So <laughs> can you tell me honestly, because he's not going to tell me, what was it like growing up with a trumpet player for a father? Gosh, how do you even answer that? You know, I, I was incredibly close with my dad and, um, and his, his uh, influence musically was really profound. You know, I consider him to be the most important musical influence in my life. I think having him not be a violinist actually had major advantages because I think that when, when you're dealing with someone playing the same instrument, you can't help but make certain allowances or forgive certain things. Like, if, you know, if something's really hard, you're like, yeah, I, I know it's really hard. I, I feel your pain. <laughs> um, I remember my dad at times, you know, just, I mean, it was, it was so frustrating and, and also so funny. Like I remember working on this Paganini Caprice and playing it for him and him. And I mean, he, he was my biggest supporter, my biggest fan. So I don't want to give the wrong impression, but you know, he kind of looked at me and he was like, that sounded awful. <laughs> and, and I was like, dad, it's really, really hard. He's like, I guess so. I mean, you know, I don't play the violin. I'm sure it's hard. Like, it sounds complicated, but it sounds pretty awful. <laughs> and I knew in that moment, I, there was not a violin teacher or a violinist anywhere that would have told me that because I was still playing it pretty well, to be honest, <laughs> but he was right. It sounded kind of awful. And I think that a big part of growing up was trying to play something, um, to make my dad happy, <laughs> you know, like you know, I, he was such a barometer for me. If he thought the performance was beautiful, if he thought that it was musically effective, if it touched him, then I knew that I had, had done my best and I had done my job. So. So basically, I guess, I, I think you, you were probably a much greater uh, influence than maybe you feared. <laughs> That's good. That's reassuring. Um, your mom was also in the arts. She was a, a ballerina. Did she also have an impact on, on you, artistically speaking? Well, yeah, I mean, less directly, of course, because it was a different artistic world. But definitely uh, my, my mother's work ethic, you know, I, I think dancers tend to have these just incredible work ethics. That was something that was really, I learned a lot from it. And interestingly, this is a kind of a weird coincidence, but you know, with a musician and a dancer, I ended up marrying a ballet dancer as well. And did I read that you proposed to her while you were playing with the New York Philharmonic in Central Park? Well, not exactly during, but like at the intermission after I, uh, yeah, I I'd, I'd played uh, Tchaikovsky in, in the park. And, um, and yeah, I actually bought a ring that afternoon. I knew that my, my wife, Kate, she grew up in Connecticut. And so her whole family was 
was coming down to New York uh, to be at the concert. And I thought, well, it seems like, seems like a good time. And, and it definitely was one of those things, like if you want to find a way to take the, the apprehension out of your New York Philharmonic debut, you know, then <laughs> that's a good way to do it. You know, you put something much more high stress and more high pressure to immediately follow it in the same night. But, uh, but yeah, she said yes, so it worked out. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. Um, during the pandemic, you famously turned your living room into a recording studio and made a bunch of recordings from home. Was this just a pandemic project or did it go so well that you're still making recordings from home? Totally pandemic project. I mean, like the sort of thing that, you know how life was so different that we all did things that now you think, what, like how? You know, there were so many things people were doing where they were like, oh, that's really nice, you know, for COVID. And it's like, that was code for that in normal times, that would really not be very interesting at all. But for now it's great. Um, and, and I was just so tired of that. It was like, well, can, can we achieve something that doesn't have to be, doesn't have to feel like it was mitigated by these really frustrating circumstances. Like in a way it was just like, I wanted to kind of overcome this feeling of just being worn down, uh, by this, this terrible world situation. So with these recordings, I feel particularly proud of them because I don't think they ended up being anything less than they could have been under any circumstances. But <laughs> that being said, the amount of effort that it took to achieve it was so much more than it would have been had I been in a position of having outside help that I don't think it would really make a whole lot of sense outside of some sort of like masochistic kind of, I did it all myself kind of pleasure. You know, it, it was so much more work than, uh, than a normal recording session. What, what was some of the work that you're referring to above and beyond the music making itself? Well, I think the logistics of it, I've got two little kids and when I make a recording, I'm generally like, you guys can stay at home on this trip because, because it allows me to just focus entirely on, on that project. But, you know, to make these recordings during the pandemic was like, well, I mean, I'm dad during the day and the schools are shut and we're trying to you know, educate the children, the realities of life and the realities of being a dad and then, okay, well, well now I'm going to make a recording. Well, how are you going to do that? You know, you clean out every bit, every stick of furniture and, you know, pull up the rugs and just kind of make this, this empty room. And, and it's like, well, I'm not making any money, so I don't have any budget and nobody can come to see me to help. I was really on my own. So I was like, okay, well, maybe I can film things on my iPhone and my wife's iPhone. And well, we've got this old DSLR camera around and I'm calling friends like, how do you do this? How do you do that? And people are walking me through stuff and I would record little samples and send them to friends. And why does this sound so bad? And it's like, oh, well, cause you did that. Oh, okay. You know, you learned that I was learning from scratch. And, and then for the recordings themselves, you know, they were filmed. So I needed light to be consistent and I needed silence. With kids, that means, well, the, really the only option is to do it in the middle of the night. So I would start recording at, you know, 1230, one o'clock in the morning. And I had this whole checklist of, you know, exactly which lights were on, exactly which lights were off and how, you know, they were dimmed exactly to this level or that level and flip the breaker to make sure the refrigerator's off because that hums. And, you know, you make sure that, that the air, air conditioning is off. If any one of those things wasn't exactly right, then it's all useless. I'll be, I'll be playing through like a movement of a box and I'm like, oh no, did I turn on camera number two, you know? And then also like the sort of flying blind aspect um, of recording without a producer where I, I told myself, I was like, listen, I'm going to take a nap. I'm going to get up and at midnight, I'm going to play the Bach A minor violin sonata and I'm going to play it a whole bunch of times until I feel like I've played it as well as I can. And, and then that's that. It's just the best you can do on a certain day when you're feeling a certain way, when you're trying to say a certain thing with it, you just have to create a performance that feels like it was 
the most committed performance they can be on that day. And then it's like that little snapshot in time. It's like a, it's like a photograph. And while you're making these recordings, you're doing so in, in complete isolation, which must have been difficult for the recordings. It was difficult for all of us. Did that time away from performing give you a renewed sense of what it is to be a performing artist? Um, I love what I do and feel so incredibly lucky to love what I do so much and to be good at the thing that I love. I think that everybody is good at something, but I think that not all people know what that thing is. And I'm lucky to know what that thing is for me and to actually really love doing it. Like I, I remember being part of this discussion one time with a bunch of soloists that, that were all kind of, you know, out of work and do basically the topic of the, of the conversation was, you know, reflecting upon what life is like. And, and it was a funny conversation. There was a lot of, I've really enjoyed just being able to have more time, this and that and the other. And okay. Yeah. I get it that people, you know, are always looking to see the bright side of a certain situation, but I was starting to get a little frustrated and the conversation came around to me and they're like, well, James, you know, is there anything that you miss about the career? Uh, about the normal life in your in your business and and I was just sort of exasperated and I just said all of it like I miss everything I miss everything about it I like meeting people that that share this love of this art form I love eating way too much big rich meals like at 11 o'clock at night I like going out with my friends and staying out too late talking about this wonderful concert that we've played in or that we've been to I like traveling and going to different places and meeting different people and learning from different musicians from different backgrounds. And I think there are a lot of people that love music, but I, I think there are also a lot of people that only because they love music so much do they deal with a lot of the other aspects of the job. Whereas I love my job. There's really nothing I would rather do. And when I wasn't doing it, I missed it a lot. I, I really, really did. I thought I would. And I did. <laughs> well, one last thing that we have in common is that we're both children of the 80s and we love Star Wars. And I am so jealous <laughs> that you played <laughs> on the most recent Star Wars soundtrack for the Obi-Wan Kenobi movie. How did you get involved in that? And what was it? What was the experience like? Well, it was it was very random. <laughs> it came about. Um, there's, there's this wonderful composer, a British woman named Natalie Holt. She got in touch and uh, she, she likes my playing <laughs> and uh, she just kind of reached out and she said, you know, maybe we could work together on a project sometime. And I thought, well, that'd be, that'd be great. And then it just randomly happened and I guess it was October I was playing in Belgium. She happened to be there for some sort of awards thing. And so we grabbed a cup of coffee before our respective events. And then it was a couple months later that uh, she sent me a very, a kind of a, a cryptic message <laughs> saying, you know, is there any chance you're going to be around Southern California in the spring? You know, there's this project I'm working on, but I can't talk about it. And eventually as we were exchanging messages on it, the nature of how secretive it was and the timing of when it was, it was like, all the signs were pointing to this being one of the one of the Star Wars projects. And so with a couple of my good friends, I was like, you might wonder, you know, maybe maybe it's something Star Warsy. And they were like, oh man, let's hope it's Obi-Wan Kenobi because that's gonna be amazing. And of course, you know, that's that that's the one that everyone's been waiting for, right? And uh right. so yeah, it ended up that that yes, indeed, she had been hired to write the the music for that. You know, the main theme was written by John Williams, but then uh, the other music was written by Natalie. And uh, and so, yeah, it happened. I was playing with the Pacific Symphony in Orange County, and there was one day where my concert was at, you know, eight at night, but the whole day was free. And that was one of the days that they were going to be uh, recording at uh, the Fox Studios in LA. And uh, both of my, my little solos actually ended up on the soundtrack too, which is kind of nice. Um, so it wasn't like I played some huge role, you know, it was just kind of a day of playing stuff that mainly was, uh, you know, ensemble work. Some of it was as much sort of sound effect as music. I don't know why you're playing this down. <laughs> I would have a t-shirt on that says, I am part of the Star Wars universe. Well, you know, I got this, I got this cap. It was an Obi-Wan Kenobi uh, cap that just says on the side, uh, 
cast. And I was sort of like, oh yeah, there we go. Subtle. Yeah. But no, it, I mean, it was, it was the coolest thing. Like my son is just as into Star Wars or more than, than I ever was. And uh, my kids, they've seen a lot of what I think of as my you know, kind of most important high profile engagements. And I think for sure in his mind, the coolest thing I've ever done was, you know, hey, my 90 second solo for Obi-Wan Kenobi. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Speaking Soundly. If you like what you heard, please tell your friends about it. Spread the word. Be sure to follow, rate us, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. To keep up on future episodes, follow us on Instagram at speakingsndly and visit our website, artfulnarrativesmedia.com. Tune in next week as we hear another inspiring artist speaking soundly. 